Well, thank you very much, Joanne, for your introduction of me, and more importantly, to Joanne and Museums and Galleries Scotland, and is it Tracks with whom you're co-organising, for giving me this first opportunity to speak in my native country about this question. I've done it around the world in many places, but this is the first opportunity in Scotland, and that means a great deal to me. And especially because having been involved with the early development of the convention, it's obviously a question close to my heart, and it's been a great sadness that as a country, as a state, the UK has not become a party to the convention, and I can only hope that we can help to build up the pressure from inside Scotland to make that happen at some point in the future. Um, I was most excited when I was asked to write a provocation piece, because I thought, great, this gives me an opportunity to be provocative. Um, then I realised that actually provocation piece probably meant provoking ideas. Well, I, I hope I will achieve that. I will try to be provocative as far as I can at the same time. Um, now, I think that I would like to thank also uh, our Cabinet Secretary, Fiona Hislop, because I think that she really did introduce a range of very important aspects of this heritage. And in a nutshell, and at the end of my paper, I want to illustrate this with a video clip. This is really an area of heritage which has huge meaning for local communities, for individuals. But at the same time, and because of that, it speaks to our sense of common humanity. That when we see the living heritage of others, it's something that we can relate very directly to, perhaps much more than we can with monumental heritage, for example. And to give you just a couple of cases between Scotland and my country, of my adopted country, Iran, we have in Iran on the 21st of December, the winter solstice, we have a celebration we call the Yalda night, where we get together, we eat dried fruit, we eat nuts, and we tell stories into the night, the longest night of the year. We have, of course, Yule here, which we associate with Christmas, 25th of December. Dare I suggest a winter solstice celebration, a very similar kind. You know, these are the things that you see when you start looking at this heritage. And equally, I was down recently in an island in the Persian Gulf and I discovered that like our coastal rowing rowers, there also are com uh, competitions for sailing the lenge boats of the Persian Gulf, which are now inscribed on the international list, in order, for the same reason, to encourage the building, the boat building skills. So we see our commonalities, and I think this is very important too. So it's working at the level of communities and at a level of connection that goes beyond interstate relations. And it can build relationships between people that can be very powerful. And it's therefore very exciting, I think. Now, I've got this little gizmo, I hope I can make it work. Um, you don't need that. Now, this, what I'm doing now, is I'm going to try to sort of crystallize a few of the points that I think are important for the provocation paper. And the first is just, as has already been stated, that two major discourses within which the convention was developed. That of human rights, and that includes, of course, cultural diversity with a value. And the second, sustainable development. And as was rightly stated, it is because the convention directly responds to these areas of which were becoming increasingly important at the end of the 1990s, that we have such a positive response from a number of states around the world. And I think in many ways it's becoming parties to this convention, apart from anything else, is a way for the state to legitimate its relationship with citizens and the cultural field. In a modern world where cultural areas are so complicated, where people's senses of local identity are under a lot of threat from various factors. And this continues to be a really central uh, context within which we are discussing now implementing the Convention. And I want to focus particularly on 
the procedural right to of participation, which happens interestingly to be a procedural right both in sustainable development and human rights. It's where the two connect, you could say. Community participation within the 2003 Convention. However, there is no question that if you start to talk about human rights in this area uh, and the right to access and enjoyment of cultural heritage, you are going to come up against some fairly challenging questions. And I have a few of them here. I think a key one is which heritage is heritage. And this comes back to this whole question of identification of heritage and giving significance. And this is where it's so important, as we see later, the role of communities in doing that. Which is the second point too. Now, how far can individuals and communities actually participate in interpreting the heritage, preserving it, safeguarding it? And this is, of course, where it's necessary to build relationships between the government authorities and communities, which in Scotland is probably not such a challenge. We're a small country, but in some very highly centralised countries it can be a major challenge. And it really is demanding of governments and state authorities a completely different way of operating from what they have done before. Now, there are, of course, with regard to sustainability, a large number of links, a very close ones. Um, I just mention a few very briefly. Food security, healthcare, quality education, and that is not just about you know, education that the methodologies are appropriate, which is important, but the content of the education to be appropriate. The environment has already been mentioned, and the traditional knowledge associated with that. Again, we've had mention, and thank you very much, income generation for sustainable communities, particularly for those that have been marginalized or face a lot of social uh, inequalities. And generally, you know, that there is no question that intangible cultural heritage does have the possibility to improve the social, economic, cultural well-being of communities and the individuals within those communities. If correctly handled. <coughs> Equally, it was mentioned, thank you, Rita May, that sustainable development and the role of intangible heritage, the fact that innovation is, in many ways, it's built upon knowledge that has been developed over generations very often. But it is equally the fact that this traditional knowledge is also a living heritage. It's something that evolves over time. It responds to new requirements, which is what we need, especially today, in so many areas. And so this is why it can be an essential basis for sustainability. Now, this is just a snapshot I wanted to put to say, you know, these were some of the main <coughs> international policy developments occurring during the 1990s, up to the point at which UNESCO was considering developing a convention in this area. Of course, the sustainable development itself is a key one. But at the same time, I think it's important to remember the whole idea of human development that was, that was initially um, an idea of Marty in 19, around 1990, late 1980s. And the Human Development Reports of UNDP have since 1990 been based on this notion. And this is the idea of where development and human rights come together, and therefore continues to be an important idea for us today. And since 1995, at least since 1995, UNESCO has been working hard to put culture back into the development agenda, or to put it in, I should say, it's never really been there. Um, and UNESCO continues that fight, it's a, a big struggle, because we're talking about two discourses that are not working together. And I think it's very much down to the work within UNESCO with regard to, for example, particularly this convention, 2003, to show to the international community how culture and heritage directly 
not just contribute to development, but are themselves drivers and enablers of development. That's really important. And that's something that we can do our little bit here, today, to put that on the agenda. Um, now, I think also it's worth mentioning that the, la the two recent conventions of UNESCO, the one on ICH, but also the Convention on the Diversity of Cultural Expressions of 2005. Now, these both are the ones that really enter into this discussion of sustainable development of human rights and of cultural diversity as a value. And it's no accident that both of them grew out of UNESCO's work in the field of cultural rights and the development of the Declaration on Universal Declaration on Cultural Rights, Cultural Diversity, excuse me. And I think that you know there was a kind of sea change, a whole new way of thinking that occurred, and that these conventions particularly represent that. And hopefully the work within them will feed into future developments internationally. And this is also where what we do on the ground locally can have a power to inform international policy making as well. We shouldn't forget that. It's an interactive relationship, or it ought to be. And equally, developments about indigenous people's rights, the rights of local communities. And all of these ideas came together, and the 2007 Convention typifies this in many ways. Now, one of the questions that we're also wanting to focus on today is this issue of identity with regard to intangible heritage. And I've actually put identity, the notion of dignity, human dignity together, and diversity, because they all really work together. And for sure that identity, cultural identity, social identity, other identities are, the protection of these is, is very important to protecting people's sense of their own dignity and therefore protecting cultural diversity, since cultural identities are so important to this, is also a very essential action we need to do. So, just asking the question, you know, what exactly does a right to cultural identity mean? Because we are talking about that when we're talking about safeguarding heritage and people's identities with regard to it. And, of course, first and foremost is the right to choose your identity or identities. And I would stress the plural here. I mean, if I look at myself, what on earth, I don't know what my identities are. But let me start with being Scottish, being European, being Iranian. Maybe I'm British somewhere along the line. I could concede that. But I was a Protestant, I'm now a Muslim. And, 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 you know. And I'm, you know, equally in personal terms. I'm the wife of my, my husband, I'm the mother of my son, I'm the, yes. We all have these identities. Some of them are imposed in a sense from outside. The fact that I'm Scottish is just a fact of my birth and my parentage. But others, and a lot of them, through our lives are things we choose. And, there, and we should have the right to choose that. And, Having the opportunity to make those choices is also about the diversity of cultural options open to us. Equally, we have a right not to have a culture imposed upon us from outside. This may not be such a strong issue for us, but it can be a big issue in countries where there are important indigenous communities. But it's also possibly an important one now where we have such a homogenized global culture, but it can be a struggle to keep the local cultures alive. And I think it's also important that we consider how the, let's say, the main dominant culture interacts with minority cultures in the country. Um, and I think within, with term, in terms of indig indigenous heritage, this is Quite interesting because on the one hand, you have the possibility of giving more recognition and status to minority heritage, but at the same time, there's the possibility of better social inclusion, as we've seen examples where 
newcomer, incomers to a community become part of what is the traditional local heritage of that community. And that, that has been a very powerful mechanism of including people within the local community. And so it has this power. And, but, there, but identity and identity construction is very complex and it works on a number of levels. We are talking very much about local communities and even individuals. But at the same time, and it was mentioned earlier, intangible heritage also speaks to national identities. And I think in the Scottish context that is particularly the case because there is a desire to assert a national identity that is not necessarily the same as the national identity of the state, the UK government, that UK state that is. But there is also, we should remember, a potential tension here between the different levels of identity. And this tension definitely plays out in the operation of the convention. Because the nomination for the international inscriptions is a state run process. And it's a, it's, it's a prerogative of the state. And therefore, it's very much up to the state body to decide which elements are given that opportunity, as it were. In some countries, there is a very democratic process, and communities are hardly involved in that, but there is no requirement on the state to do so. And so, there is, as I say, a potential for tension. I think when we discuss this whole question, about identities, I think we should bear in mind these different levels on which it operates. We also, of course, have the rather interesting case of different countries claiming the same elements. I come from a part of the world where this has been rife. Southeast Asia, oh, sorry, East Asia, again, is another region where there's been a lot of this. And, you know, yes, it's problematic on one level when you know, you have a country claiming in its own name a particular heritage that you think is yours. But hopefully we'll reach a stage in the future where we have more nominations from states together saying we have this shared heritage. And that it becomes much more a, a reflection of just how much we have in common with each other. Huh? And at the same time, as I say, I think there's a very important point that the national heritage as it's presented is something that should as much as possible be through a democratic process huh? and that it really is the state acting as a mediator between local communities and the international level and I hope that's something that we can build here in Scotland and I think we're starting to with the, the process of the inventory and the way that's been done is a very open platform and the initial white inventory which is great and, but I think also we do have to be very careful that what we are celebrating is the diversity within our cultural, culture and cultural heritage. I think there's a, a potential for a sort of disappearing into a very monocultural view of, in our case, what it is to be Scottish. Um, but we should very much work to, uh, to celebrate and highlight the heritage of newer communities within the country and at the same time, and I think this is important, encourage members of immigrant communities to put this forward themselves and to feel that it is something important and valued. Because I have to say when I look at the participants in this room, I don't think I see too many people who represent minority communities and I find that quite interesting and it suggests to me more than anything that there is work to be done within communities to raise awareness of this area of heritage and of its importance and that their heritage is part of it. Um, Sorry, I put a whole lot of things on one slide which makes it difficult to know where I am. Now the, the question of cultural rights and challenges of relativism God, this is a big question. I don't want to get into the detail here. It's in the provocation paper. But it's, it's one of those, it's the elephant in the room. We can't speak about cultural rights without recognising this challenge, let's say. 
Now, in terms of the treaty text itself, as has been mentioned, there is a human rights filter, as it were, that for intangible heritage to be formally recognized as ICH under the Convention, it must conform with international standards of human rights. At the same time, there is a degree of discretion open to governments as to what they recognize as national heritage. I think we should remember that. Um, because if we were to apply a really strict uh, human rights filter, I think we could possibly exclude a good 80% of what we might want to call intangible heritage. Now, the point I really want to make here is this is a matter, as so often in human rights, of societal dialogue. It's up to each society to discuss, you know, what, where are those limits to be set and to be just that we should have a very good awareness of the fact that some traditional practices and some of this heritage can be seen by mem some members of the community to be damaging to their interests and their rights in other ways. And this is about, first of all, recognizing that communities are by no means homogeneous. I think that's the bottom line issue, is to recognize there is always a diversity of voices within communities, and to find ways that, those, that diversity of voices can be expressed and heard. And, as I say, that to, each country really has to decide for itself what is or is not acceptable in these terms for the national process. Um, the, I, did, I just put this slide, this is actually in the text, I don't need to go through it now, but there has been a very clear statement of where the limit is to be set within a, a human rights viewpoint here. That, in other words, cultural diversity is not in itself a sufficient basis to then discriminate against people and to violate of the human rights they hold. So it is an issue we have to bear in mind. Um, but at the same time, where it's complicated, oops, sorry, I'm not there yet. At the same time, where it's complicated is the fact that we know perfectly well that the, the well-being of other community members may well be based on the continuing practice. Or their sense of So there is a very delicate balance that we should find. And, you know, where do we draw the line? That's for each society to decide. Do we draw the line of practices that are physically harmful? Or do we include practices where, you know, choosing a marriage partner from outside one's community is deemed unacceptable? You know, where, where do we do that? And I'm not going to try and tell us to take where we should, but we have to discuss these matters and keep them in mind. Now, in terms of the question of the participatory approach and how that is very key in terms of the way the Convention can work towards the goals of sustainable development. You know, participation, as I mentioned, procedurally speaking, is one of the important approaches within sustainable development uh, model, and the Convention clearly encourages this. And in fact, it can be said that the Convention has really put on the table quite a new paradigm in heritage protection, one which creates quite a lot of challenge to governments to be able to put it into practice. Um, and this one, for example, shifts the focus of assigning significance to heritage away from the state towards the communities. It redefines the role of non-state actors with regard to state authorities in the process and a range of non-state actors. And it moves away the whole concept of national heritage away from a purely state-driven concept. At the same time, ICH responds to the requirements of sustainable development because of its cross-sectoral character. I mentioned health, education amongst sectors in which it's very relevant, food security, peace and security, etc. 
And so ICH has that at the same time as it being a requirement of sustainable development for governments to work in this conceptual way. So it is an opportunity for governments to put that into practice. And this horizontal cooperation is something which is a real challenge to governments to do. Well, ICH may be one way in which that can be done. And of course, the convention makes it very clear communities are at the center of this whole process. And that is in itself going to inevitably mean that we have participation as a central approach. Now, the question of sustainable development within the convention, I've already mentioned, how it can contribute to sustainability. Again, I don't want to go into much detail here, but I think it's quite interesting to note that if we look at the reporting cycles of two years of states parties to the convention, the years 2012 to 2013, we see that more than 50% of states parties reporting actually attempted to incorporate safeguarding and tangible heritage into other areas of government policy. I think that's really quite an astonishing fact. It's, it's really very surprising. It's very positive. It's encouraging. And it, it suggests that, as I just said, ICH does have this potential also for governments to find an entry point into sustainability, which itself is an incre incredibly challenging question for governments. Yes, of course, it, as we've seen, it can be a driver for development, you know, through the cultural industries, for example, sustainable tourism related to an ICH, etc. I mean, there are many, many ways in which it can be. And, of course, clearly can make major contributions to local economies, and this, of course, is a point that was mentioned before. Um, at the same time, it can help communities that are living in, for example, the urban context. I mean, the urban context is one we really have to think about because it's not been well discussed up to now. But it's one of the contexts in which you find a lot of communities that are, you know, incomers, they may be internal migrants, they may be immigrants from overseas and others who are in different ways marginalized, excluded, and that through the ICH, it's one way in which, first of all, they can capitalize on their social and economic and other resources, but at the same time, it's a way in which their own status can be raised and the relationship they have with the wider community can be improved. But, of course, again, the proviso, we have to be extremely careful how we seek to harness, harness intangible heritage in terms of development, particularly economic development, because there are clear dangers of you know, commercialization, distortion, commodification, etc. Now, as I mentioned, non-state actors are very key. I'm, you know, I just put up a list here of a range of those potential actors. There are many and various. NGOs clearly are very important, as we see today. Especially, though, because NGOs often actually have an expertise that governments don't have and in different areas. And it's very important that the NGOs are given that space. And a space that can go not just as far as advising governments nationally, but actually to the level of advising the intergovernmental process too. And that we've got two examples here of NGOs who are in that position. Um, local government authorities, I would also add as a key player, they have an enormous role to play in, in supporting ICH in, in so many different ways, but in many ways, infrastructurally and logistically and financially. The private sector, I mean, this is a major, very important question, because there are many private sector, uh, you know, bodies that are interested in this heritage can be of great benefit to the heritage and the communities, 
But at the same time, clearly, what they do has to be within a sort of framework that respects the principles of the Convention and the, princ the principles we want to operate with regard to intangible heritage. And it's a discussion we need to have, essentially. Now, I don't really want to go into the details of the, you know, the Convention says this, the Convention says that, uh, with regard to community participation, but simply as to show you that there are, and this is just a significant point to bear in mind, there are direct references within the text of the Convention to this, which is, I can tell you, highly unusual in an international treaty in the cultural heritage sphere. And it's also an opportunity for us really to, to work on finding ways to do this. And note, not only is there a strong encouragement to governments, at least an encouragement, one could argue a requirement in some ways, to include communities in the whole range of activities for safeguarding this heritage. And, oh, how on earth did that happen? Um, oh yeah, okay. Notice this, the range of activities, what are they? They start with identification. That is so key. And that can really shift, shift completely the whole basis of the process. Because when you involve communities in their identification, then you're saying that how we understand heritage is something you know, which is for everybody to have a say in. You know, the, the name of this meeting for everybody, for everyone. Documentation and research. It's not just an expert process, not just university researchers. Again, and there are many models now of participatory research where community members are trained in research methods. Right through to all these other actions. I don't have time to, to go into them, but note, note the last one, to involve them actively in the management as well. And actively, you know, meaningful involvement. This means design of plans, action plans, as well as the implementation of them. The, as was mentioned, the operational directors to the convention have, you know, are, are dynamic and they evolve. And this is an important aspect of the convention, in fact. The main text is there, sets out the broad lines, but the operational directives set out the detail as to how these are to be implemented. Most recently, we now have a set of directives that will, are addressing the question of sustainable development. In 2010, we had a set of new directives as to how community participation can be acted on in practice. And just note, what are the various areas in which the uh, directors address this question? And note particularly that parties to the Convention are encouraged to create a consultative body with a coordination mechanism, or another kind of coordination mechanism for this. Now, if this actually is done, then it will be potentially very powerful. Uh, and certainly there is an increasing pressure coming from the Intergovernmental Committee for this. Now the last uh, subject is the case of urban ICH. I mean it's, it's very strange actually that so much of the emphasis has been on rural ICH up till now. Because, as we see, you know, already 54% of the world's population live in cities and we're looking to, for this to reach 66% by 2050. And notice, I think this is important, as much as 90% of this growth is going to be occurring in Africa and Asia. And those are two parts of the world where this form of heritage is particularly significant as the total heritage. Therefore, the question as to you know, what can intangible heritage contribute to urban communities and how you know, who are the actors and how it can be harnessed for improved social and economic and other well-being of urban communities is incredibly important. And also even, you know, how does the heritage interact with the fabric of the city, the physical fabric? That's another question. So, 
conclusions, a few conclusions that are worth just wrapping up with. As, a, as I mentioned before, as a living heritage, ICH can contribute in a number of different ways to community sustainability. Their livelihoods, the quality of livelihoods, and to the physical environment within which people live. It's also, without doubt, broadened out the concept of heritage considerably in ways that possibly we haven't yet imagined. You know, this is definitely, this is an ongoing process. And um, it's occasionally quite scary, really, but it's hugely exciting at the same time. That granting official recognition to what may be a very ordinary, everyday heritage for people can be very empowering for many communities. And a powerful force for their social integration and generally for better social cohesion. I'm trying not to repeat myself too much. And as I say, also, I just think the range of different stakeholders who are involved in this process is extremely important. A number of different stakeholders are represented today. And I think it's, we really have to work on figuring out, and that's something we can discuss today, is figuring out how we can, how we can work together and cooperate between stakeholders who may have a very wide range of different interests here. And there is, I think, the, the, the notion of dialogue, I would like to finish with. Social dialogue, dialogue between these actors. Now, if I can make this happen, you see what I've done here? On your right, we have, I think her name is Marion, making, in the process of making Harris Tweed. What I like about this is the way that she's using the environment around her. It shows how the environment and the ICH interact directly. And, on the right, Iranian bagpipes, which we just three weeks ago inscribed on the national list in Iran. And that's actually, there's a story behind that, it will be very short, but worry Joanne, that the bagpipes, they represent the culture of a minority in southwest Iran. And in the locality, their performances are often you know, stopped, prevented, raided by the police, whatever. And when we inscribed them in Tehran, part of that action was in order to protect that heritage in the locality where the local officials were trying to prevent it. So there's an interesting dynamic going on here uh, about that. And if I can make this happen, I must leave you with some Iranian background. Thank you. Preventing a public performance. So they got together, all of them, and they did this. So also ICH can be quite subversive at times as well, which is one of the powerful and attractive aspects of the two. So, um, Thank you, Janet.
It's uh, very thought-provoking. Um, we've got time for some questions now, and I've got one online, but I'm going to jump in with the prerogative because I've got the mic and ask a question. In the past, we've spoken about, um, you did a lot of the country reports in terms of how the, yeah. the convention is being operationalized. And you made a comment to me, and I just wanted to explore that, that you said the important role of museums in the implementation yeah. of the convention, that you noticed that there was a direct correlation between the role of the museums and the adoption of the convention, the operationalization. Mm -hmm. And if you could just sort of explore that a little bit. Certainly. Yes, in fact, it's in the provocation paper. I just, I, I meant to mention it today, but um, yes, it, it's something that has just come through on, on when these parties are reporting on what they do to implement the convention. What is, I should say, what is happening, because it's not necessarily what the states are doing. And it's notable that museums play a various, a variety of important. I mean, on the one hand, you have museums which are actually designed specifically to demonstrate ICH as living heritage, you know, rather than simply having, you know, the, the physical object with a description. You have bearers within the museum, you know, where, where they actually workshops and they're quite possibly also teaching people how to make various crafts, whatever. So there, that's one approach. And very often through the educational programs and the outreach programs of museums, there's a lot of work being done. And education in different ways, you know, education, formal school level education, and including ICH in that. And museums play a role both in bringing school groups to the museum, but also actually in going to the schools. Uh, non-formal and informal education, lifelong learning, etc. It's a very major area that museums are working in. And I think museums also, also simply can provide a physical space. You know, this is a really big question that comes up a lot. It's just the, at times, the lack of physical space is appropriate to the enactment, the performance, whatever, of ICH. And I think this is particularly true when you have ICH elements which have migrated with people into a new context, usually an urban context from a Euro rural one or even from another country. And museums often are the places that are supporting these communities. Not only museums though, sometimes it's the local library or the local community centre, sure. But they are, it seems to be they're, they're, they're a key player in this. And so making museums aware of this role they can play is very important. Okay, any questions from the floor? Um, can you wait for the ro roving mic? It's just coming to you. Bob? If you just say who you are and where you're from. Uh, my name's Bob Clark. I run the uh, museum at Akendryan in Argyll. Thank you, Dr. Blake, for a fascinating talk. And I'd like to respond to your provocation with a provocative question. Um, uh, at what point does um, intangible cultural heritage that has stopped being current becomes something yeah. that should be left in the past and forgotten. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can cite two examples in the context within which we work, we operate in a part of uh, Scotland that as a result of universalization and education has forgotten its Gaelic, has forgotten that it was part of the Highlands and has been universalized. We also work with the, the, the Scottish Travellers, a very much marginalised community, um, who are uh, responding to a changed world by trying to absorb themselves within it and almost consciously choosing to forget a very, very rich and extremely intangible and often ephemeral heritage. Are we right to say, no, stop, actually you mustn't forget these things, or are we doing the wrong thing? <laughs> Thank you for that question. You're quite right. It's provocative and it's a very difficult question. I mean, it's such a complicated area. Um, first, uh, it's interesting. The convention itself would say, at the point at which an element has died out, the convention is not aimed at bringing back to life a dead heritage. That's the official position of the treaty. 
and there was a major discussion in the intergovernmental negotiations about this very question. You know, are we talking about if a heritage is like, you know, in the ICU, okay, where are we, you know, more abundant but not quite dead, fine. You know, the, the, the negotiators sought to draw the line and say where, you know. But countries are doing different things here. And I was, in fact, about three weeks ago in a discussion in Iran where it's clear that certainly for Iran, heritage that may no longer be practiced, but that is still part of the memory of people and that means something to them and their sense of identity is something that Iran wants to place on the national inventory list. So I think this is a case where different societies are going to take different views on the matter. And I think it is up to each society to have the discussion. And, but you see, it's like if you take the analogy with language, you know, linguists will say, I mean, I'm not an expert, but I did read a bit about this, and from my reading, I understand that linguists do have quite a very specific approach methodology about when is a language a dead language, when is a language one to be revived, whatever, uh, and the idea that, yeah, there is a natural, you know, decline and a natural extinction that perhaps is not the place to intervene in. I, th I mean, personally, I would think that one of the really important issues is when there are people who, who want it, you know, not, not government bodies, but when there are people who identify with these elements for whom it's still a vestigial aspect of their identity, at least. I would personally say that's enough in the same way as speakers of the language, or once not speakers, but or where there's like a really small language community, but they're very motivated to continue that language, then, you know, the government should support them in doing that. But it's about people's self-identification. That's crucial. Okay, thank that. Could be that. Um, now, I've got a question from online. This is for Rita May. So, if we could just get a mic to Rita May. Um, this is from uh, Rafael, who's watching from Mexico. And it's... Um, what is the main challenge facing ICH for its safeguarding process since the um, UNESCO Convention was implemented? That, that, that's also a difficult <laughs> question. It, you, there are so many ways to respond to it. It also depends on the context of the community, it depends on what the challenges are in terms of the safeguarding of, of, of a specific um, ICH. Because the ICH, although there are some factors we know, for example, as more we tend to globalization, urbanization, there are different threats that uh, specific elements are faced with. But there are also um, things that, that are very specific to the element itself. And I would say that one of the most um, recognized challenges since the implementation of the convention is the transmission, the, the issue of transmission. And in, uh, passing on this um, very dynamic heritage to, to other generations. It's often cited as the major area um, for, for elements um, at threat of, of disappearing, for example. So it is very critical um, to introduce in safeguarding measures a transmission process that ensures the continuity, continuation of the heritage from, uh, from the older generation, for example, older community, which is often to the case, to the young people, the youth. Um, this is sometimes seen uh, as, as one real threat um, faced by many communities the world over. Okay, thank you for that. Um, have we got time for one more question from the floor? Any more questions? Brian? She's coming. Rian O'Hara from Board to Gaelic and Creative Scotland. I'm just wondering why do you think uh, UK government is so hesitant in signing up? Sorry, sorry for asking that. <laughs> this is where I get to be provocative in my provocation <laughs> presentation. It's such an interesting question. I mean, there, there are possibly lots of answers and I don't have the inside track here, yes? But I can speculate. One is simply a sense that this is an aspect of heritage that belongs in the public domain. 
there is a cultural marketplace which can regulate itself. Yeah. I think one, one is this view of heritage and culture, which is the sort of very liberal economic approach. That's got to be one of it, one part. But there's also, it's definitely the case that at the negotiations for the convention, you had a, an alliance between the Anglo states, you know, with not just UK, but with Australia, I think New Zealand, yes, South Africa certainly. And part of it may also be that some of these countries particularly were concerned about the status of indigenous groups and that they were afraid this convention would give, as it were, too much support to demands that go beyond purely the cultural sphere to land rights and such issues. And that UK government was, was actually also simply supporting them. Who knows what was the payoff, you know, in some other intergovernmental forum, possibly. I don't know. I mean, here I'm an international lawyer by nature, we're cynical. Um, you know, but there could be no reasons. And also, but I think the bottom line reason up till now has been not a sufficient sense of importance. And I think it's, I mean, this is a discussion that Harriet and I had in Riga, do you remember? And we came up with an interesting idea as to why this might be. And why is it that in Scotland it's clearly an issue of great importance? And not just Scotland and in other parts of the UK, but not as far as the UK government view. It may also be to do with where you feel that your, your cultural and national identity is an oppositional one, and therefore you're more likely to place an importance in this aspect of heritage, as opposed to where you just feel that yours is actually the default mode, and you therefore don't have the same degree of political will invested in the question. That too. Tap alive. Okay, I know there are other questions, but we're going to have to move on now on the programme. So, well, sorry, Anne, we'll, we'll come back to you later. Um, so thank you uh, very much, Janet. And um, I'm sure people will be talking to you throughout the day. Thank you, Janet. Thank you.